join me in prayer, please. Father God, I just, I thank you. I thank you for your plan of redemption. Lord, where would any of us be without it? I thank you for why we were enemies, your enemies. Jesus, you came to die for us. I, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that this plan doesn't rely on us. It totally relies on you. Because if it were up to us, we'd mess it up. So, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, as we come before your word today, Holy Spirit, you do this work in us. You reveal truth to us. You tenderize our hearts. You help lead us into obedience. And so, Holy Spirit, would you do the work that you do? Would you illuminate the word to our hearts and minds? And would you help us be the people that you called us to be? We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, what a, what a great week it's been in some ways. Um, obviously, you know, when we start our new ministry year, uh, I, I just love seeing people coming hungry to learn more about Jesus and more about the things that we teach. It's awesome to see. Uh, it just, you know, there's, there's just a freshness and an energy that always comes the first week of the new ministry year. And uh, that might be because a lot of our kids are here. Nothing brings energy in life more than little kids, right? And, and so it's just been fun to watch and fun to be a part of. And uh, it, as a pastor, it kind of renews uh, your focus on, on why we are here. Uh, you see, obviously, it, it's a twofold plan that God has. One, one is to get people saved, uh, to take us from our present course, which is destruction, uh, based on our own uh, hearts and, and the fact that we're lost, and, and bringing us into the kingdom of God. That's step one. But then step two is to restore and redeem us. And, and this, is the, this is this massive piece of what it means. And, and, and if we don't, as believers, so I don't know where people are today. I don't know if you can honestly say that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. If, if you can't honestly say that, then you really need to get to the point first where you can, where you surrender your life to Jesus. But then those of you that have done that, there's this ongoing work, this ever-present work that God is doing in your lives. I know this to be true. How do I know this to be true? Not because of what you're doing, but because Jesus says that's what's going to happen. And so it's up to us whether or not we believe it, or if we do believe it, how do we respond to it? You know, sometimes I think we throw out these terms in the, in the church that says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? To believe in Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that your life no longer belongs to you? Does that mean that you've surrendered your, your purpose and your, your, your reason for living to serve the Lord? Does that what that means? And maybe it does at times. Maybe the other times it doesn't. Maybe the other times it's like, you know what? It's just hard. It's hard. I go back and forth. If, you go, if you're in the back and forth, that's okay. That's what happens. But we have somebody to help us in that back and forth. It, this, this back and forth does not rely on our power to maintain it. What it relies on is our willingness to be led, to be led by God, by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, so much of our lives, it's not that we have to bootstrap it and make anything happen and work our way into heaven. What we do have to do is surrender to God's leading and allow him to be the Lord of our lives. It, once we get to that place, everything starts to make more sense. I want to I wanna give you a Charles Spurgeon quote, and this is kind of where we're going to start from today. But Charles Spurgeon says that, so, so uh, it, people say, well, what is the unforgivable sin? Well, Matthew 12, Jesus says the unforgivable sin is actually blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is that? Well, let me give you this quote first. Charles Spurgeon says, the greatest crime of sinners is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And the greatest fault of saints is to neglect the Holy Ghost. 
So let me explain that to you because it's going to kind of give us understandings to go forward. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is basically denial or mocking or rejecting. It's this idea that, well, that's just goofy nonsense. That, that's, you know, we, or we attribute the works of the Holy Spirit to Satan or we, you know, we just kind of, we close the door on this. But this is something that happens prior to conversion, prior to saving faith. And this is this place where people, so some people think, well, I'm, I was going along fine with Jesus, but then I accidentally blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and now I, that, that's the one sin that can't be forgiven. If you're wondering what scripture that is, that's Matthew 12, verse 31. Jesus says that. That's more kind of on the front end. There are people that mock and reject and deny the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, if that's what you're going to do, that can never be forgiven. That, that You can't overcome that, because that's the hurdle. Believing in Jesus, yeah, you know, obviously it manifests itself in faith in Jesus Christ, but ultimately it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because we can't believe in Jesus until the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And so uh, it's this picture, but then Spurgeon says that now for believers, he calls them saints. Scripture refers to us as saints. That might be a stretch for me occasionally. But it's, it's this idea that as a believer, we, we no longer blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but we do neglect the Holy Spirit. We ignore the Holy Spirit. Or we, you know, in a sense, not maybe not verbally deny the Spirit, but in, by the way that we live. We just live according to the flesh. Because that's what we knew, and that's easier because we're familiar with it, and people may not say anything because we'll look just like everybody else. You see, when you actually, when you are living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that's when we start doing things. That's when you actually start gaining ground and, and taking ground for the kingdom of God. And that's when people that oppose that, that's when they come against you. So it's just easier. It's just easier to look like everybody else. But yet still have that saving faith that's going to give me eternity in heaven. It's a compromise. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't compromise. We do, but the Spirit doesn't. And so we have to know that going into it because sometimes as a Christian, you feel like you've lost fellowship with God, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to make the argument, you, that's actually not true. What you've done is decided at some point to stop listening it's like when people say, uh, just uh, I'll give you a little foretaste, and, and please uh, don't get me wrong on this, but, but, but in marriages, people don't lose their love. Okay, they don't, it's like, well, I no longer love this person. I've lost my ability to, I just, I don't have any love for them anymore. No, no, really what you're saying is, I've decided to stop loving them. And, and maybe there's reason for that. But, what, but let's just be honest. It's not like it's something that we have and then all of a sudden it's something that we've lost. What happened, what happened to love in a marriage? It's that somewhere along the line, either one or both people said, you know what, I'm just not going to do that anymore. And Christians do the same thing to God. The same type of thing. We walk along, we have this wonderful, beautiful relationship. Maybe we just have, it's like the newlywed phase. Everything is, whoa, it's great, it's wonderful. And then at some point we're like, you know, I'm just going to stop listening. And then it's no wonder that the relationship suffers. And so what I want to do today is I want to redefine our relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that you haven't done anything that has ended that relationship. See, while humans may be fickle, and we may walk away from relationships, God doesn't. And so we're gonna define that, we're gonna allow Jesus to tell us about that, and then at the end of this service, it's gonna be up to you to decide what you do with what you're about to hear. And so I'm gonna invite you to consider, as we go forward, that today could be just a totally new day in your relationship with God. If you're coming in here and you feel like it's dry or it's non-existent or something has changed, maybe today's a day where you get back, right? 
So let's hope that's the case. So as we go into our text today, what I want to do is we're going to be in John 14. Uh, th- those of you familiar with the way, we know John 14, 6. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, Jesus, uh, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is having uh, his last time with his disciples before his betrayal and his arrest. This is known as the great discourse, which is kind of like the final big instructions that come from Jesus. And ironically, well, not ironically, but purposely, Jesus spends a lot of time telling them about the Holy Spirit because this is the big next thing that's going to happen in their lives. And so he begins, we're going to start, we're going to, uh, John 14, we're going to start with verse 12. Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done, even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. That right there is like, no, wait a minute. See, see, this is the kind of the first, this is the first big kerblooey that Jesus throws out there. So you're going to actually, so here we have Jesus, we have the Son of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit in human form dwelling among men, and Jesus says, you know what, it's for your best that I go away and all this stuff happens, because in the long run, you are going to do greater things than I have done. Now last week, we spent a lot of time talking about spiritual gifts, and I told you that there's three, uh, there's three kind of major ways that the Holy Spirit is described in Scripture. Number one, which is where we're going to be mostly today, is the gift. This Holy Spirit is described as a gift, and so we, we have the gift of the Spirit. Number two, we have the gifts, plural, which we talked about last week, which are powers that the Holy Spirit gives us for serving each other and the church, gifts, And then the third one we're going to be talking about as we go forward is the fruit of the Spirit, which the fruit of the Spirit are virtues or characteristics that develop in believers over time. So we develop these these character traits as we walk in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness and self-control, you can't just walk over here and say, okay, today's the day I'm going to be more joyful. We'll see how that works, right? I say to myself, well, I'm going to be more joyful, and then I, then I get, you know, I think everything's fine until I go to a mall parking lot, and then it's just all out the window, right? But over time, these character traits are developing and deepening in me, and so those, that's the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk about that. Today, we're going to focus on the gift of the Spirit, Jesus says, you're you're going to do something better than I can do. You're going to do greater works than I did because I'm going to go be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. It's no wonder the prosperity gospel is an easy sell, right? Lord, I want a a Mercedes, right? Lord, I want... uh, I don't know, what do I want today? It's not how it works. He's not a genie in a bottle. There's got to be something on our end that is, that is making us re- make requests properly, right? You take a person who's lost, you give them free access to the Father, and their natural inclination, if I'm a selfish person that's, that's primarily concerned with my things, then I start to justify all kinds of selfishness in the name of Jesus. This is what I want. It, but if there's something not working in us that's actually changing us and bringing us in, to conform in the likeness of Christ, then we're going to be offering things up in error. We're going to be asking for things improperly. We're going to be asking, you know, we're going to be asking God for our favorite sports team to win the national championship. Right? Well, what about all the other fans of the other sports teams? Does God, does God love them too? Right? Do you see how these things get twisted? But, but, but if, if there's something in us that's changing our hearts and our minds, 
and we are altering from our, our pre-relational uh, state with God, which we had all kinds of weird things about God, misunderstandings, all kinds of things that we didn't get, and now something's changing me. My prayers change. And now instead of asking for selfish things, I'm asking for things that bring glory to God. Where did that come from? It came from the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we go on. Jesus says in verse 15, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. We're going to stop right there. A lot of things being said here. So Jesus, so let's, let's, let's kind of picture this. So we know that Jesus ascended to heaven. Right now as we speak, Jesus in human form, resurrected human form, is sitting in heaven next to the Father. And so there's like this picture of Jesus uh, he's called the mediator. He's even referred to, Jesus is referred to as our advocate in heaven. So we have Jesus in heaven advocating on our behalf with the Father. But there's another advocate that Jesus is going to send that is going to be with us. Uh, so just real quick, when you hear the word another, I love the Greek language. Because the Greek language is very descriptive. So when you hear another, there's, there's actually multiple words that are used. Now in English, we have another, right? So in the Greek, there's two different words that are actually mean another. One is the word heteros. So in the case of, for example, heterosexual, heterosexual talks about another of a different kind, Right? So, so sometimes another means another of a different kind. So it's like, I've got another idea for you. It's a different idea than what I had. It's different. But sometimes it means the same. Just another of the same kind. And that word in the Greek is the word alos, A-L-L-O-S. That is the word that Jesus is using here. He's not saying, I'm going to give you another option. He's saying, I'm going to give you something that is exactly like me, but different. And that's, that's a monumental truth. So the Holy Spirit, you know, sometimes people struggle with this idea that the Holy Spirit is a person. Is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, all fully God. But they function as one. They serve each other. They actually have roles in the ways that they interact. And, and part of our understanding of the Holy Spirit is understanding how the Trinity works in their roles in our lives. And Jesus is giving us a hint to this. He's saying, I'm going to be with the Father, and I'm going to be over here advocating on your behalf. And he's going to send you another advocate who is actually going to be with you. So I want you to picture this courtroom. And in this courtroom, you've got the judge, the father, who everything, this is all his plan. The entire plan of redemption. Scripture says that only he knows the dates when all this is going to end. So this is the father's plan. It was his plan from the very beginning. And he's, and he's unfolding his plan. And part of his plan was that the son was going to go to the earth and make a way for people to be reconciled with God. And so Jesus, in his role now, standing next to the judge, is a mediator. He, he, he understands our weaknesses. He felt pain. He gets what we're going through uh, on earth. He's been there. He's thirsted. He's hungered. He's had all, he's been tempted and so he's sitting there advocating, mediating on our behalf, and we're over there standing before the judge. And with us is the other advocate, the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is so oftentimes in a courtroom, you have a situation where a person is guilty, but they're trying to get out of punishment. They're trying to get off, but they're not really interested in changing their behavior. Not really. Maybe they feel bad because they've been caught. 
but then you give them freedom or they get off, they most likely will offend again. But what makes this unique is that the Holy Spirit is going to be working in us. We're not trying to get off scot-free or get away with anything. Basically, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, is saying, I'm with this person. We're going to work on this. And this person, I'm going to change their heart. I'm going to lead them into truth. So this person isn't going to walk away and just poo-poo the whole thing and just go back to a life of sin without any conviction. The Holy Spirit says, I'm here. I, I got him. I know Steve's a problem. I get it. I know he is. But I'm working on him. Right? And Scripture says, Jesus says, that the Holy Spirit will never leave you. See, this is where we have to think. We, get, we have to change our mindsets, and we think, oh, man, I've just been so bad lately that God has forsaken me. Uh-uh. That's not, that's not correct. God is with you. Maybe you've neglected him. Maybe, maybe you've forsaken him. God no longer listens to me. Do you listen to God? See, we, we like to deflect, don't we? We like to throw it all on God. But what are we doing? See, I, I, I think, and, and this is based on, you know, just observation. It's based on experience. But so oftentimes, you know where we go wrong just in everything is we deflect responsibility. We just won't accept it. We, we just, no, it can't, it can't be me. It's got to be them. Or, no, it, you know, it's got to be your fault. You know, and there's always, we're always deflecting responsibility. But what happens when we sit there and say, you know what? I made a mistake, and I'm, and, I, and I'm sorry. Why don't we do that? Have, have we ever been in this situation where we've done that, and it, we regretted it? But yet we don't. We don't do it. We deflect. And it, it, it just, so the point of all of this is, is that the sooner that we surrender to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and we stop, reflect, stop deflecting, stop making excuses, do you know the number? You know the number of times. I, and please, if any of y'all are here, I, I, this happens so often. I don't actually think of anybody when I say these things, because it happens a lot. But I sure do run into a lot of people that have just you know that they there's been a point in their life where they're really active in the church, and then they just stop and they're just out there doing all kinds of things. And you know what I always hear when I run into people? Oh, I've just been so busy. I've just been so busy just so busy. I need to get back to church. They'll say something. I need to get back to church. So I'm sitting there going, so do it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I just, I've been really busy, and I just, I'm, but I really need to get back to church. So I'm just like, so do it. Well, you know, you know, it, just, it just goes on, and eventually I'm like, well, you know, I hope to see you sometime. It'd be great to see you back. But at some point, you just got to do it. And that's the way it is with God. At some point, you've just got to stop making excuses, stop deflecting, and just do what you know you should do. And things change. Here's another word picture that uh, kind of the Lord laid on my heart. I, I, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll make a little confession to you. I have a TV show that I like to watch, and um, it, it just, I don't know, it just fascinates me. It's Dr. Phil. I get up in the morning, <laughs> and you know, I just can't, I can't stand the news. I just, I've reached a point, I don't live with my head in the sand, I get just enough news to know what's going on, but I don't watch the news networks because it's just like, blah, 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 and I don't like it. So I'll turn to Dr. Phil, which is always on in the morning, good old Dr. Phil, and uh, he, it, it, I find it fascinating. Well, every so often he has this situation where he has this, this troubled teenager, that is just refusing to listen to their parents, doing all kinds of rebellion, just basically making decisions that destroys their life. I mean, and you're sitting there watching this thinking, why do people do this? I mean, what, what rationale is it that I'm not getting along with my parents, so I know what I'll do, I'll just exercise my freedom and destroy my life? But that's what we do. And so it's interesting to watch this interaction between the parents. There's this point where there's so much hostility that they just can't, they can't even talk anymore. 
So typically what Dr. Phil does is he kind of, he says, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the teenager and we're going to set them, we're going to basically separate the parents and the teenager, and we are going to send counselors to work with both the parents and the teenager. And then after a period of time has passed, we'll bring them back together and hopefully they can reconcile their relationship. But I find it interesting that his approach is counselors on both sides. Because you see, when you have hostility between two people, it gets to a point where both people can be wrong. Now, I'm not saying God's wrong at all. But what I am saying is that in a sense, in, in this sense theologically, we're the rebellious teenager. And we have lost our relationship with God. And what our Heavenly Father has done because he's awesome and he's perfect, is he has provided a way to be reconciled by the use of the Trinity. We have a counselor, a counselor that lives with us, that teaches us the truth, that helps change our hearts, helps develop these virtues in us so that we can have a relationship with God. But just like on Dr. Phil, uh, these teenagers, when this plan unfolds, they go kicking and screaming. No! Ah!" You know, they have sometimes the guy send this big, they call him a handler. And he comes in and he's like, no, you're going. You're going to this. You're you're, going to do this. This is not an option. You're going. And they're just, you know, fighting and kicking and screaming. And then then it fast forwards about a year later or so. And everything's everything's better and you'll see the you'll see the rebellious teen going yeah i just was i just was wrong i didn't know what i was doing and and it, it, I, I, that's just a picture to me of the work of the holy spirit in our lives but so many times so many of us are kicking and screaming and we just need to stop and trust the lord he goes on to say the holy spirit who leads into all truth So ultimately what the Holy Spirit is leading us into is God's truth. That's why it's so important we have scripture. And it works, the Holy Spirit, he works in conjunction with the word of God because this is the truth. Sometimes people that push back, that don't have the Holy Spirit in their lives, they push back against scripture. Well, they don't have the Holy Spirit revealing truth to them. So we have to understand that Uh, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. The world doesn't want anything to do with the Spirit of God. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Where does the Holy Spirit reside? In the hearts of believers. Where is the temple of the Lord? where the Lord resides on earth. And where is that? The hearts of believers. This is this amazing picture. For years we had this picture in Jerusalem of this temple of the Lord. And in that temple of the Lord, we had the inner, the inner room, uh, the, the, the mercy seat, which is where the presence of the Lord dwelt, uh, called the holiest of holies. That place still exists on earth but it exists in the hearts of true believers. See, now you are the temple of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. And it's not like the Holy Spirit is just going to vacate the temple. But that doesn't mean you're listening. It doesn't mean you're obeying or you're following the Spirit. It just means that the Spirit is there. And, you know, as my pastor Kevin used to say, it's almost like the Holy Spirit says, you know what? When you're ready to listen, then we'll start again. It's almost like the Holy Spirit says, if you're going to rebel and kick, I'll let you go only so far. But we're going to basically kind of sit here until you're ready to listen to me. That's the good news. The Holy Spirit won't let you go so far that you go too far. But the Holy Spirit will let you go a ways, unfortunately. And so that's, that's kind of like this picture that if, if, I, if I don't want to surrender my life to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit lead my life, I, I will walk into things that can harm me. But when that happens, I know the Holy Spirit is with me. 
But what's the Holy Spirit going to do then? Let's get back to the truth. Let's get back on track. I'm not going to show up and miraculously make this situation go away. I'm more interested in making you holy than making you happy. But I do know that true happiness comes from holiness. So it's this beautiful picture of how God is working in our lives. He goes on to say, No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. Real quick gut check question. Do you you live as though Jesus is actually alive? Do you believe? Do you believe that there's a dynamic interaction here with a living God? Do you have the expectation that the that living Jesus Christ reigning in heaven actually might have something to say to you? And it might be unique to you? Do you live with that expectation? When you pray, if you pray, are you, do you, are you actually praying to somebody that in your mind is actually there listening to you? I know sometimes it's hard. I get this. It's not like if you struggle with this, you're the only one. But this is the key to it. Jesus says, since I live, you also will live. Because I'm alive, you will be alive. Because this is real, you'll experience something real on a level you can't imagine. He goes on to say, when I am raised to life again, you will know, you will know that I'm in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. He's using a Trinitarian language. See, if you have what's real, then you will, somewhere in your mind, you will know that all this is true. There may be times where you struggle or you have doubt or, or maybe your faith wavers a bit. But in your heart of hearts, you know that Jesus is alive because you've met him. People all the time, I think they think I'm a pastor, I'm a religious guy, I, you know, I, I've been taught something and, and I'm regurgitating some information and I'm sitting there going, no, no, I, I've actually, I, I know Jesus. I have this relationship with him. When I am alone, I'm not alone. I'm actually talking to God. I'm actually, God is telling me things. Sometimes it's things I don't want to hear because it's truth. But this is really happening. And so if, it, you know, I, I don't know again where you're at, but if you're in this place where you're kind of questioning everything, I want you to hear from my heart of hearts. This is not religious nonsense. This is as real to me as anything I've ever experienced. And this is one of the reasons why nothing gets between me and God. I don't care what it is on earth. I don't care how much in my flesh. I love it. It's not going to take me away from Jesus. It's not going to do it. And, and that's kind of this, this picture and and, and you, wouldn't do, you, you wouldn't necessarily do that for a religion. But you would for somebody that you know and you love and somebody who interacts in your life. He goes on to, goes on to say, as he goes forward, he, he says, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them. We'll come to them. We'll make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate, uh, it's a Greek word, uh, paraclete. It's it's counselor, it's comforter, it's advocate. As my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I've told you. I'm leaving you now with a gift. A gift. Peace of mind and heart. See, this is the other thing. Where does peace come from? Peace comes from God. It comes from following and allowing God to lead your life and, and, and seeking to obey him and getting to this place of peace. The peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I'm going away, but I'll come back to you again. 
If you really loved me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father who's greater than I am. I have told you these things. Now, this is a verse you need to remember. I've told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. There are people out there that actually believe that the Christian movement today is just an ancient relic to what happened 2,000 years ago. That's ridiculous. There's no way a movement is maintained for 2,000 years. This is a movement from God himself, fueled by the Holy Spirit. And people may say, well, what about, you know, what about the Muslims? What about all the other religions in the world? Not one of them has the Holy Spirit. Not one of them. They have some, they, they have some requirement uh, where your righteousness is based on doing certain things correctly. Christianity is the only religion that says your righteousness is based on what Jesus did for you. Now you're going to be given the advocate, you're going to be having the Spirit of God with you who's going to guide you in your life. And that changes everything. So it's this beautiful picture of of how God is working in your lives. I've told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. I want to take you now to Pentecost in Scripture, to Acts chapter 2. And Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit comes, 10 days after Jesus rose to heaven, ascended to heaven, we have this account. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. They were speaking in languages because at Pentecost, they had Jews there from all over the world. And so they were speaking in their languages. And the reaction to this was, man, they've got to be drunk. They're acting like fools. This was this response. But then Peter steps out and he talks to the crowd. So all, this is such a happening that people are, they're, they're seeing this. And Peter steps out in front of them. Verse 14, Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk. As some of you are assuming, nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Nine o'clock, what time is it? Interesting. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. The other men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Boom. Scripture says that, three, that, that over 3,000 people were saved that day. 3,000. See, this is this picture of God unleashing his power and it's, and it's affecting people and it's, and it's giving new life to people. It's bringing the dead to life. See, this is what God does. This is what he really does. He doesn't bring the living dead. He brings the dead to living. And I can remember being completely dead to any of this. And I went to church. I grew up in church. I, I sang in the chorister choir. I tell the story. I was in the bell choir in my church. I went to YF. I went to youth fellowship. I did all those things. And I was dead to all this. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Until one day, I met Jesus. And it all changed. It all changed. And I read this and I get emotional because I just, I feel, I know there are people here that, that, 
that, that don't know this. And in my heart, I want that more for you than anything you can imagine. More than anything. I want you to experience this. And the only thing I can tell you is that you, you need to surrender. You just need to quit fighting. You need to quit kicking and screaming. You need to quit deflecting. You need to quit making excuses before God. And you just got to come and say, you know what? I'm done fighting. I'm done with it. Lord, I trust you. I trust you. Now lead me. And it changes your life. Here's this beautiful picture. So here's what all these people did. It says, uh, going on in verse uh, in verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to, and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Sounds like a church service, doesn't it? <laughs> it says, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything that they had. It says they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. It says they met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Well, that doesn't sound like the church today. No, it doesn't. You're right. Because we're too busy neglecting the Holy Spirit. We're too busy living by our own strength, by our own power, by our own flesh. We're just too busy doing those things. But I will tell you that when we actually trust God and do what God tells us to do, these things actually happen. I've seen them happen. I've experienced them happen. I see it almost every single day here at The Way. Do you? Where do you stand in all this? I can remember a day when I was on the outside looking in, and I didn't get it. Not here, but at my old church. I remember that day. But then I remember the day that, again, it all changed. And I've never looked back. Never. I've never regretted I have never regretted any ounce of my life that I've given to God. I'll tell you what I regret are the ounces of my life that I didn't. That's what I regret. So what I want to do, I, I, I want to see. I, I, you know, I, I got, I'm going to make a confession here. There's a part of me that, is, that wants more of this. I want more fellowship in the Spirit. I want to see more people get saved. I want to see more lives changed. I want to see that. But that's really kind of up to God too, isn't it? So I'm going to trust the Lord that he's going to continue to do exactly what he says he's going to do. And in that, there's going to be people that respond and there's going to be people that don't. I just want you to just say to yourself, which one am I? Just be honest. Which one am I? Well, if you've been a person that's, that's rejected God or resisted God or whatever it is, that can all change today. You don't have to leave here being the same way you were when you came here. So what I want to do is I want to invite the praise team back up here, and I'm going to pray for us, and then we're just going to open up this time. You know, as always, we have communion available I just want to urge you, that this, this is, a, this is a, a way not of participating in a religious ritual. This is a way of responding to God. There's something about hungering for God as you come forward for communion. Uh, we're, you're welcome to do that. We're going to have prayer ministers available. If you just want somebody to pray over you, I'm going to be up here. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus today, uh, you can go talk to prayer people. They'd love to pray with you. I'll talk with you. Uh, if you want to just come up and worship, we kind of uh, people have been starting to come up to this side of the stage uh, and, and they're just maybe taking a posture of humility and worshiping the Lord. But I just, I just want to invite you to respond. Respond in love. Respond in trust to God. Quit your fighting. Stop resisting.
and just surrender. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word today. And Holy Spirit, I just, I thank you for your work. I thank you for the ways that, Lord, we, we do kick and we do scream and we do resist. And yet you lovingly hold us in place. And you continue to invite us. Continue just lovingly to invite us back. Lord, let this be a day where if we're wayward, let this be a day that we return. So Holy Spirit, I lift this part of the service up to you. This is, this is about what you, Father, you, Jesus, and you, Holy Spirit, are doing together in our lives. And so we lift you up and we praise you and we trust you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to keep unpacking the Holy Spirit. I want you to be, I want you to at least know what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. For those of you that, that love Jesus and love the Holy Spirit, perhaps it'll, you'll have more than what you came with throughout this series. That's what I want. I want you to have more of God. Maybe some of you are here, you're kind of teetering on the fence. What is this stuff? What's going on? I, I, I want you to meet God in a way that will rock your world. Because, again, the status quo of the world is not what we're after. That belongs to somebody else. What we want is we want kingdom purposes. We want kingdom power. We want kingdom transformation because that's eternal and that's what lasts forever. So I'm going to dismiss you now and I just want to urge you, stick with it, keep growing, keep seeking, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your lives. So receive this blessing as I dismiss you here today. I just pray that you leave now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship, the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day and a great week.